All right, good morning, everyone. It looks like we are ready to begin the second uh, class in this series. I welcome you today. Um, I just wanted to point out, maybe many of you have seen, we have a resource table in the back that has a lot of amazing resources on it. The death images that we worked with last week and will continue to are available if you'd like to pick up one as well. And today we are preparing the bereaved, exploring our healthcare wishes and goals. This is part one of a part two series. We'll skip next week and then we'll continue part two the following Sunday, <clears throat> which just as a reminder, it's at 9 a.m. on the 19th because we have a joint service that day. We won't be meeting next week. We will. we will. I'm sorry, but this is part one. Of part two won't be until two weeks. We'll do something else next week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, is, so it's at 10.30 next week, as usual, but it's something else. That's right. Okay. That's right. And there are schedules for the whole series on the back table as well. So welcome. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start by reading a few of the comments that were put in the Dropbox, because I think they kind of queue up some of our hopes for this session today. We loved all the feedback and the questions. We're hoping to touch on a lot of them. We know we can't cover all of them. We've also intentionally brought books that we hope would speak to some of the topics that we might not get to in depth. So please do check out the resource table and some of the books are available to borrow. So pay attention if there's one that you're wanting to, to take home and take a photo of any that you want to remember from later. But a couple of the comments. I love this one. It says, I have always thought that my death should be handled in a way that the living, those who love me, would feel good about. Is that not important? That's the best kind of thinking for what this two parts um, workshop that's part of this broader series is trying to accomplish is to make sure that we are prepared to have good conversations with family members and those who uh, need to be empowered to make good decisions about our own end of life wishes. So that's really the goal for today. A couple other comments ways to prepare the bereaved, specifically adult children. I think that one of the most important things we can do for thinking about bereavement is actually thinking about end of life and empowering people to make choices that they know will be consistent with what we want. I can't understand what you're saying. Oh, sorry. You need to step back. Sorry. Just a little louder. louder. Okay. okay. Good. Um, were there any other So we won't get to all the comments and the feedback, but we're going to try to touch on as much as many of them as we can. And um, the conversation doesn't stop at the end of the series either. So we wanted to start today with kind of a conversation about choosing healthcare agents, as well as beginning to think about our own end of life wishes. So I wanted to start just by asking, what, what do you all think of when you think of advanced care planning? When does it happen? Who is it for? What is it? Um, first, my brothers cannot agree on the time of day, so, um, and, and I think they shouldn't be in the dark about what I want at the end of my life. So um, I have uh, done estate planning and, and uh, I have an advanced directive that I'm not entirely satisfied with, but um, mostly it's my gift to my brothers. Great, great. So a gift to family. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thing? It doesn't have to be the right answer. What do you tend to associate with advanced care planning? Pre-surgery. Pre-surgery. So at critical moments. Yeah, great. I think a lot of people tend to think it's only for a time of crisis. So I need that document. I always have questions about its legality. Yeah. Like how how do we ensure that it is upheld? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. I think uh, I think about it that our kids mostly don't want to talk about it. So we right. bring it up and they're like, let's talk about that later. You feel like to put that off. Yeah. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, I think I have a definition from yeah, I think I brought it. Yeah. So advanced care planning, the definition from a, an organization called Respect and Choices that I like is advanced care planning is for all adults. It is thinking and talking about future healthcare decisions if you had a sudden event like a car accident or illness and could not make your own decisions. A person close to you would need to make choices for you. We call this person a healthcare agent, or there are some other terms we use for that. So we often tend to think it's only for a critical time, only for very end of life, but terminally ill. 
but really advanced care planning is just that it's advanced because what if any of us had an accident tomorrow and even if it weren't a terminal illness or a chronic condition what if you couldn't make decisions for yourself for the next couple days a couple hours you were in a coma you're unconscious would your loved one be empowered to make decisions would they know what you would want and do they have the legal standing to do it do you want to talk about next system please yeah, in Colorado, we are one of only three states considered not a next of kin state before death. After death, we are, and I think we'll talk about that maybe later, but in our series, but right now there's only three states where we do not follow a prescribed kind of order of relationship. What that means is if I leave here today and I hit my head and I am not able to answer questions about my care, the doctors treating me, the nurses treating me would not necessarily go first to my husband and then to my adult children. They do not follow a prescribed list. In 47 states, that is exactly what they do. I love, and I know Alex loves too, that in Colorado, we don't. Because when they're following that prescribed list, they're not paying attention to our specific relationships, right? right. We might not be in relationship with our parent or our adult child. So that puts a little, it puts a little more pressure on us, but it also puts a lot more power in our hands to decide who do we want to answer these questions. So we're gonna talk at the end of our time together, we will leave you, we, we will send you with documents to start filling out so easy. I'm telling you, five, 10 minutes for the, the most important one. And that's the medical durable power of attorney. That empowers whoever you say to speak for you. When we don't have that, say I did go to the hospital, I hit my head, I didn't have that on record, I didn't have a copy of it in my phone or in my, on my person, <clears throat> the medical professionals have to talk to everyone in my family and everyone who might be expressed as having interest, they have to come to consensus about who is my medical durable power of attorney for that instance only. It's not ideal, it's not great, it happens to me every day in the hospital, I work on that, but you might wanna think more about who you want to speak for you. And really think about that. We're gonna, if you get two weeks, we're gonna really yeah. give you time. Yeah. Cause this is important stuff. Important, yeah. but not the, the legal part of it, the document part is the easiest part. Yeah, and I think one of our biggest takeaways from our series is that really what we wanna say is that choosing your healthcare agent and having good conversations that continue to be robust and evolving as your own healthcare evolves, those are more important than any documentation. The documentation is definitely important, but what I've seen, what I'm sure you've seen is that at the bedside, what really matters is when the doctor says, hey, family, what do you want to do? That the family says, I knew if it came to this, this is what he or she would want. More than pulling up a document on the computer, hopefully that always happens, but really empowering family to know what you would want is the biggest gift and the most timely, I think, way of approaching. So our, our hope is good conversation and then thinking about that agent. So if you, does everyone have a copy of our worksheet for today? Folks online will get it to you. We'll, uh, we'll try to copy paste it in the chat here, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't be missing too much. So if you look at number two, it says choosing a healthcare agent. So other terms you might hear, our um, healthcare proxy, medical power of attorney, or medical durable power of attorney. That's what the actual form is. So who, raise your hand if you know for sure you have a medical power of attorney on file. Good, good. Okay, great. On file, not just, a lot of people think, oh, I just assume it'll be my partner, and we've had some general conversations. But it's really important that we, not only have the form, but we've talked to them about what that role is. And I would suggest that it's not always the person you would assume that it should be. It's not always necessarily your partner or your oldest child. It could be a niece, it could be a cousin. So those look at those four, um, <clears throat> four kind of recommendations for who to choose. And you can, you can change too, if, if you're your partner's power of attorney and you think, you know what, I would just really, really struggle in that moment. I really just want to be able to focus on my own, what I'm going through, and that would be really hard for me. That's okay. We want to be honest about that. So you want an agent who is able to accept the role, talk to you about your goals, values, and preferences, 
Number three is probably the most important. Follow your decisions, even if he or she does not agree with them. And then make decisions in difficult times. So that's what we want to have in mind when we think about who that agent should be. So I'll give you a minute, especially for those of you who don't have this on file, just jot down who this person is or who you think would might be a good candidate for you. What do you mean by on file? Do you have a medical, so the document what, what file? Medical durable power of attorney. But I mean, file where? File where? Ideally with your doctor. With your doctor. But if you just have the paperwork and someone, that's the thing though, does someone know where to find it in a hurry? That's, <laughs> right. That, so I have one, but I, it's in my file cabinet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what good is that? Yeah. So that's part of our homework. <laughs> yeah. so, well, the other part of that is that once you have that power of attorney, piece of paper, yeah. make sure that your primary physician has a copy. Exactly. Yes. And make sure your agent yeah. Yeah. that you picked has a copy. Yes. Well, yeah. most good medical powers of attorney will say a copy is as good as the original. That includes electronic copy. If you share that PDF, which is the scan form, with your agent, they can show it on their phone walking into the emergency room. Yeah. The medical power of attorneys, you'll always be asked for them when you go in for elective surgery or something like that. They'll want them on file. The time that you need your agent to have them is when they're following you to the hospital for an emergency type of situation. What normally happens is when you get hurt, they take you to the closest facility if you can't make decisions for yourself, that's usually some kind of head trauma. Inevitably, the hospital emergency room you're in is not <laughs> the one good for head trauma, so you'll be taken off. So by the time your agent gets there, they're kind of following, and they don't have time to run home and grab your document. So you can have them uh, scanned on their phone, and they can they can get in and make decisions for you. And maybe scanned on your phone as well in case that person is out of town and we need to call them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But then you have to have it on the screensaver because a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times they don't know your, your code That's and right. things like that. But, that, yeah. but th there are ways to do it if you think through it. And the best is to have a mobile copy with the people that you do. And you want to have a deep bench too. Because if you just give your a deep bench of people you want to yes. pick, because if you just pick your spouse, you and your spouse could be in the truck when the pickle yeah. truck hits you, yeah. and, you're, and you both need somebody else. So when, we, when we go over the form, you'll see that you can list alternates on there. So we'll want to make sure your alternates have them. Yeah, really, really good point. Imagine you're traveling out of state. You're going to the, net, the most close ER who is not your doctor and doesn't have it on file, even if you've done all that. So yeah, making sure your agent has a copy. Good. Okay, great. Any other questions about your agent? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so like if you you have UC Health, which probably most of us do, and they ask, well, we need an updated copy of all this. Well, it's in the will, but what what does that mean? Is do they like destroy them after a year? I thought they had so just yeah. make sure they've got the most current one over where you would most likely be involved at UC Health. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And we in, in different hospitals, our systems communicate with one another, not always beautifully. But if you're in UC Health and you're at one, one hospital and you come to my hospital, which is not in that system, there are ways I can find it. Okay. So just keep make sure that you have it with work. So the deep bench ideas overall. Yeah. And we'll go over, we'll um we'll have you give you guys the, that two weeks to look at the documents and come with specific questions about them too. When we go over that. But again, I think what that drives the point home that the most important thing is. The conversations that you've had with your agent they know where to find the form they know that they're your agent and they know what that means and what you would want you know you can't go over every potential wish but they've got a general sense of, of what you're wanting and we'll, we'll go through that next time too and i don't think it's limited to older adults not at all i think it's really important for parents sending adult children off to college yeah. because how many accidents happen in college and yeah. who will make that decision? Right. Thank you, Jan. I brought 75 copies of each of these forms so that you can take a couple for that exact reason for your kids, for your grandkids. We have um, some folks who come into the hospital and they say, wait, can I, can I have an extra copy for my kid? Absolutely. This is good for all of us. The more that we all have this, the better, the less our healthcare system is taxed. Yeah. by trying to get all of this stuff worked out when they should be caring for uh, the individual. Right. Or,
So how does an emergency or hospital personnel know who might actually be in our hospital? Yeah. And then so I think of that piece. Um, so those folks online, we're going to at the end, we'll send you the, the hyperlink to all the documents. People here can get them in, in person, and we've got links that we'll send you. So, but yeah. Mike's also got links in the chat box. Oh, nice. So awesome. great. Thanks, Mike. That worked, right? Okay, so we'll we'll return to those documents if you have any questions. Um, we'll give them out at the end of today. And then we can go over them. Part of your homework is actually to make sure that that's filled out and that you've begun that conversation with your agent if you haven't already. Um, so then the next question is, what do I tell that person? What are my healthcare wishes? What are the possible situations that I want to think through? How do I know what my own thoughts and, and leanings are? So we're going to start exploring that today. We'll again continue to explore that in two weeks. But I wanted to give you all a few minutes if you look at that portion that says exploring your current state of health and any medical conditions. I won't ask you to share this. I'm just going to give you some time to jot down your own thoughts, uh, especially things that you might want to have in mind to be asking your doctor next time you see them. So what do you understand about your current state of health and any medical conditions? What problems do you think you may have in the future based on your state of health? What fears do you have related to any conditions? Are there any questions you have for your doctor that you want to take a note of? We'll just give you a couple minutes. And again, we won't ask you to share this, but this is just to get you thinking. Okay, and when you're ready, if you're still working on that, keep going. But when you're ready, flip the page. And one of the best things that we can do to understand what we might want or not want is to think about what we've seen with our friends and our family. What have they gone through? Or what have we gone through for ourselves in our past experience in healthcare or in hospital visits? What have you seen or what have you experienced yourself that you would like to avoid in the future? Or maybe you really admired it and you would like to make sure that that's something that you lean towards. So have you been in the hospital lately or any time in your life for any of your own medical needs? Is there anything you learned from the experience about your own wants or wishes regarding treatment? And then tell us about any experience you've had with family or friends who became seriously ill or injured. What did you learn from the experience about what you would want yourself? So again, we'll give you a few minutes and then we'll open up some sharing to see if that brought anything up. All right, if you're writing, keep going. So let me stop you. But did that bring up anything that anyone would be willing to share? My husband and I have recently been through this with the death of his brother. And uh, he uh, was a severe alcoholic. He's really been somewhat disabled for many years. And his wife has always taken care of it and, and, and worked full time because he also lost his, his work. And, uh, and he became very, very, I mean, he was tube fed, he was uh, diapered, all of the above. And, uh, and we all were like, oh, Linda, just give up, you know, and, uh, and she wouldn't, and couldn't. It was uh, so, where before it seemed like cut and dry. I don't want anyone to have to take care of me that way. But on the other hand, it was so important for his wife. And so that it became a lot more complex than uh, a simple I don't want to be bedridden, not able to see, not able to speak, which was his situation. He, he got through five different cancers that went on and, you know, all of this care that, and all of the money that went, you know, for this kind of care. And my gut reaction and, and my husband certainly was um, no, 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 no. But then seeing how important it was for his wife, it's way more complex than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so have I resolved it? Mm -mm. <laughs> but, um, but I'm just um, here to, you know, we've seen more than we had imagined because we were there in his last days. A good friend and mentor of mine had a stroke and was having a hard time speaking. 
and she had selected her husband and daughter to have power of attorney. She, I think, had a six page or more of all the things she did not want to have happen, including a feeding tube. And her husband and daughter, the first two times I was able to get her to say when we got to the hospital that she did not want it. But when I wasn't there, they succeeded and she died very angry. <laughs> and I have taught all of my interns at New York University and everybody I know, make very sure that your wishes can be honored. Yeah. And that's one of the most important questions to me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michelle. I think that in a sense it, it's happened in our generation of people where we don't give the doctors the opportunity to drain our funds. That's what they were out to do. In my generation yeah. of people, I, I saw them take away everything that they worked for in all their lives. When, you know, they're basically a vegetable. Yeah, yeah, and you get the right so to now, So now we have this say so. Yeah, and even if there's no malintent, which sometimes there is, um, mm -hmm. doctors are not, they're trained to treat the disease at mm -hmm. every cost. And so part of our job is to empower ourselves to decide what is no longer an okay cost for me to pay. Mm -hmm. So we, we are able to extend treatment quite a bit in this, in this medical day and age. And it brings a lot of complicated questions for us and the need for us to be able to say, this, this is my line in the sand. Doctors won't know to honor that if we don't. So good doctors are good at having that conversation, but not all are trained in doing anything but treating until the very end. So, and, yeah. You know, I just didn't add the other part. I even went to her lawyer to see if there was anything that could be done. And he said, absolutely not. Wow. Hmm. Well, the most, the better we can avoid that, that's the goal. Beautiful. I think we're going to shift into an activity to keep diving into what we are talking about. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, just a quick question. You were saying two people were had the power of attorney for one person. So how many powers of attorney do you have? They're alternate. I've seen some powers of attorney that people co-name people. That's a little complicated for mm -hmm. the physicians. Mm -hmm. But in the form we'll give you, you name first one agent and you mm -hmm. can name up to two alternate. So that if they tried to reach your first yeah. one, they couldn't reach the first one, then they would go to the second and then the third. Okay, yeah. And that's what your deep bench comment is about. I yeah. Yep. So my Mark is my first, and my dad and my brother are my alternate. But they would only okay. take in the year if Mark couldn't be reached or couldn't make it. Somebody got a question. Thank you. Well, I was going to also make a comment about like the, your, your agent. You know, I got a bicycle crash and I'm in the hospital. I was taken in. I wasn't in bad shape, but, but I'm on a bunch of pain drugs. So I could answer questions, but my wife would just do that good properly. <laughs> so it's another thing to consider. You know, when when should that agent? Yeah. Yes. So when you get your form, there's a place that says, "By this document, I intend to make a medical medical power of attorney, which shall take effect either immediately upon my signature, or when my physician or other qualified medical uh, professional has determined I'm unable." to make my express or own decision. And for as long as I'm unable. So it's not forever. It doesn't go into effect right away, unless you want it to. Yeah, good, really good point. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit and work on an exercise. This is called Go Wish. It's created by a nonprofit organization. And so I'll hand these out in just a second. Uh, you're gonna see a piece of paper with 35 wishes on it. These are different wishes people have for their end of life care. And then at the top, you'll see three different categories, very important, somewhat important, not important at all. So the goal here is to kind of start very gently teasing out what our own priorities, what our own wishes and values are, um, kind of discovering what that interior dialogue is like. So the process would just be to read a wish. If it's not important, you can cross it out. If it's very important, you can circle it. You can use the number system, whatever you want. Um, so here's the important thing, these decisions and wishes and values very definitely belong to us as individuals. And at the same time, it is truly a gift, an extraordinary gift to be in a community like this, uh, where we're in a room with thoughtful, kind people who are considering the same issues. So what we're going to do is give you all a few minutes to work on it yourself, gently, 
And then we'd like, I'll ring the bell and we'd like you to choose someone in the room who you don't know very well. And you can start just a gentle dialogue around this as you work further with it. Um, so again, the gift of, you know, starting to explore our own wishes and also um, being able to have conversations around these issues. And I'll ring the bell again and we can have a little uh, debrief. So I'm gonna hold this back just, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, Alex was just saying, this is an actual card. Yeah, like the death deck to have my family with me to be able to talk about what death means. So these are some of the yeah. items. Yeah. So it comes in two forms. I think most of us will be working from the page, but um, we can also use the, the cards as well. The documents are important, but they are not the most important thing. The most important thing is these conversations, like I said with your uh, beloved, with God, and with yourself. So we have, I made, I think, 75 copies of each of these, and uh, you are welcome to take extras, as long as everyone gets one, to share with people. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is this, and then Alex will give you homework in just a minute. Um, this is not a document. This yellow page comes from the Conversation Project, and you can look them up online too. This is really a worksheet that helps guide your conversations with your folks who love you. Okay, so there are all kinds of things to, to uh, rate from one to five. If I had a terminal illness, I would prefer to not know how quickly it's progressing is one end of the spectrum. And the other end is know my doctor's best estimation for how long I might live. Right, so these are all spectrums and, and you're gonna move along that spectrum all your life. So, Use this as you're thinking with yourself, maybe journaling with yourself as you're talking to your agent, as you're talking to other members of your family too. This is a document we've really been talking about a lot today, the medical durable power of it for healthcare decisions. Like we said, so easy. I'm just gonna say one or two things about it. The back is entirely optional. On the back, you can have your agent sign it. So they're agreeing on this document to, to take that um, responsibility, but you do not have to. Please talk to them and let them know. <laughs> you, you also can notarize it, but you don't have to. It's a good idea if you might travel across state lines, though, because some other states do require you to have it notarized. Right. And witnesses. Yeah, right. And witnesses on the back, too. So you just fill out your name, use your legal name, uh, your agent's name and contact information. And then this is where you can name up to two alternates. If you don't name two, I would put a line through that so that no one can change this document later. What? If you don't, if you don't choose them, right? And then at the top of the other, this left-hand column is where Alex mentioned you can, you are to determine when this starts, right? Either right this minute, Raven is going to make every single healthcare decision for me for the rest of my life or it will go back and forth, that power will go back and forth depending on my capacity. That's, that's where you initial that. There's a little part here where you can put specific instructions. For some of you that will be valid, for many it won't, right? So you might know right now you never want to be intubated no matter what. I'm gonna talk about that in a couple of weeks. So I would hold off on that a little, little bit and then you sign it. That's it for that document. Is this the form doctors want you to fill yep. out? Because I went to the doctor, they said, oh, we want you to fill it out. This is the one. They it's actually wonderful. want you to do a couple. Yeah. <laughs> this is the most important. Oh, yeah. This is the one that says who is speaking for you when you can ask. Okay. okay. This next one is a copy of a living will document. There are so many options. So many, you know, some run to 10, 12 pages with lots and lots of nuances. Again, just take this with you and... Maybe you already know what you want in terms of intubation, feeding tubes, all of that stuff. Maybe you don't, that's okay. This is again, something to, to guide your conversations and your thoughts. Do, do some people put down on the form after consulting the doctor, they make a decision with the doctor's help? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
That's that's usually for determining incapacity. When that happens, when the agent can take over, um, a lot of times you can say, I would like this disability panel, my, my friends or my family with cons consultation with the doctor to determine if I'm incapacitated. I'm and in the hospital, the doctor is the only person, the physician is the only person who can actually deem someone incapacitated. And that goes into a whole other line of work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think much more important than having a living will is, is having your, your agent. That's my experience from my side of the yeah. And I am sorry, I don't know your name. So, Joe, and your example is a really good example of when even having a living will didn't help. And we'll talk about that. <laughs> Which is why you need the conversation. And you need, the and the you need them all the time, right? We're going to ask you to do one in the next couple of weeks. But those of you who already know who your agent is, I want you to still think, huh, <coughs> this person's still appropriate. Right. And Amy will share in two weeks when we dig a little bit more into the specific decisions you'll need to think through, like times you might want to change from being full code to DNR and then back again, right? It's an evolving conversation. So we'll, we'll dig into that more together. So if you have a will and then you have the medical, you don't need to have this change in the medical notarized if you do the will. Oh, so this is, yeah, we're talking just about the medical okay. living will. You don't have to have that notarized. Not in, the change state, it. not in the state of Colorado. But how do they know which is the final one? The date. The yeah. most, the most, updated. Updated. yeah. You okay. could do one of these every single day, and it would be the most recent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. Alex, what you're talking? No, thank about. you. <laughs> Those are two. So the MDPOA form is the one where you choose your agent. This one right here. The second form is a living will, also called an advanced directive. So your homework is to talk to your chosen healthcare agent, make sure they understand the role, feel comfortable performing it. Fill out that form, bring any questions you have about it. We can go over it together. Um, make sure that they've seen it. Ideally, the form is the way you're talking to them. So you're going through it together. Um, I, we would love it if you bring your, 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 your medical agent may be here with you today, but if not, we would love it if you could bring them, even have them on the phone for that conversation or for part of the conversation. Say, hey, I may step out of the room and call you. We're gonna go through some questions together. Um, if not, we can you can take some uh, conversation pointers back and, and have that later. But if you can bring your agent with you in two weeks, we would love that. And then finally, yeah. How many doctors are you giving them? Four? Uh, so they were giving you four. Yeah, four. And actually, Amy, I haven't told you about the last one. Yeah. <laughs> right. This last one, all of these, Elena is going to put on the back little okay. takeaway table. Yeah. This last one is a DNR form. In DNR stands for do not resuscitate. That means you've decided that if you are in need of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, that you do not that want that to be done. This is a long conversation, not only with your agent, but probably also with your healthcare provider. This is one that might change throughout your life. Yeah. So take, those, take them all today, look at them, make a note of any questions. Your only homework is the MDPOA agent form. But again, just bring it back with any questions. Um, what was the other? Yeah, just begin to look at all those forms so that we can dig into them a little. But again, our real encouragement is the forms matter, but they really matter as a conversation starter so that your agent knows what you want, you know what you want. Okay. All right. Downer. No, no downer. <laughs> I'll step back up. Yes. All right, friends, we have a lot in our heads, right? We're going to do a spiritual yeah. practice to get us a little bit more into our body. Elaine is putting those papers on the back a table, and you are welcome to take many copies. So this practice we're going to do, I'll walk you through it. It's a practice that I created like most of my practices out of desperation. It's a breathing practice. I created it in the hospital and I see it. Um, and I call it it has a theological name, the breath of kenosis. Maybe we'll talk about that at some point. Right now, we'll just call it the breath of surrender or the breath of allowing. Okay, I'll walk you through all of this. Uh, at the end of this practice, I'll bring us back into our bodies. At that time, Elaine is going to start playing the music again like she did last time. 
From now on, we're going to ask you to be in silence in this room. If you finish the practice or at any time during the practice, you'd like to get up and go perfectly fine. You're welcome to do that. Please remain in silence. Likewise, if you want to sit here afterwards and be in this space for a while with the music, you are welcome to do that. We just ask that That's this space be silent. Can you put some of the forms over here so we can have that in case the living rooms are there? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, while they are doing that, I just want to say one thing about practicing for our death. We have lots of ways to do it with our minds. We even have ways to do it with our emotions. We rarely practice physically, practice physically. And that's the most challenging part. This is part of, of human incarnation, I think, that we have this um, just this drive for life. And so when we try to imagine what being dying feels like in our physical form, it is very hard to do that. But we get chances all the time to practice for our death, like every time we exhale. So that's the basis of this whole practice. You practice, you exhale about 20,000 times a day. Not all of them are you awake for, so we'll say, I don't know, two thirds of that. Those are chances to practice a little bit for your, for your death. And I would advise, um, yeah, spending a little bit of time working with your body when we, when we come to your death. Lots of, lots of ways to do that. All right, so in this practice, like all practices, when I ask you to close your eyes, you do not need to. But if you don't want to close your eyes, we just ask that you have kind of a soft focus. And the intent of that is to draw your, your focus inward, okay? So closing your eyes, getting comfortable. I want you first to allow your body to take a posture of holding on or of attachment. Move your body, make a facial expression that to you feels like holding on to something really tightly, not letting it go. Really use your body in this practice. Feel what it's like to hold on, to not release something. Good, and shake that off. And now, allow your body to take a posture of allowing yourself to be empty. Try not to think about what that means. Just allow yourself to be empty. What is it? What do you sit like when you're allowing yourself to be empty? To that posture throughout this practice if you if you lose focus just come back to your physical form reminding your body how to sit in this allowing space and turn your awareness now to your breath don't change your breathing pattern at all just start paying attention what does it feel like to be breathing in this body, in this moment. Good. And now as you watch your breath, I invite you to extend your exhalations just a little bit, nothing forceful. Just extend every out breath a touch.
beautiful. Continue paying attention to your exhalation. And then at the bottom, when you have exhaled, just hold your breath for a bit. Again, nothing forceful. If it feels bad, stop it. Lengthen the exhales and pause for just a beat. Fully empty. And then allow yourself to breathe in. already practicing right now. The last thing you ever do in this physical form will be to exhale. You're practicing that right now. And the last piece, if you're willing, is in your head as you exhale each time, repeat the phrase, I surrender. bringing your awareness to your physical form, dropping any breathing, coming back to your normal breathing, dropping any attachment to your breathing in a certain way. Feel your bum against your chair. Feel your feet on the floor. And you're ready to your eyes. Amen. 